Okay, now the broadcast is being recorded. I apologize for any inconvenience for those of us who are waiting online. I just wanted to say hello and welcome everyone to today's presentation for the necessity for arts and health. I'm gonna briefly introduce you to today's presenters and then we'll begin um, shortly thereafter. My name is Heather Flattery and I'm the manager of membership and marketing at the Society for Public Health Education. I'm joined today by three amazing presenters who are gonna talk about the necessity for arts in health and healthcare and really give a context for what that looks like in the work that they're doing each and every day. First, we're joined by Elaine Poggi, who is the founder and president of the Foundation for Photo Art in Hospitals. And at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to find more information about how to reach out to her and how to find more about her web um, link online. Next, I'm joined by Jill Sonke, who is the director for the Center for the Arts and Medicine, the University of Florida College of the Arts, and also the assistant director for Shan's Arts and Medicine. And last, it's LaDonna Tornabeen, associate professor in public health at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and she is also the co-chair of our Arts in Public Health community of practice. So I look forward to learning all about what they have to share with you today, and I'll leave it to LaDonna to start. Hi, everybody. First of all, I just want to acknowledge my co-presenters. They're an amazing group that we're here with today, and I appreciate all of you. But I want to start a little bit about an overview of arts and health. You may have seen different de definitions out there, and they do exist, but I chose these three for a reason. And I'll give you a little bit of time to look over that one. But I really want you to notice the first definition contains three words that are really powerful to promote maintain or improve health and well-being and that is something that really corroborates with a report that was done by the world health organization in addition to the second definition the introduction of the arts into healthcare settings and that also includes photographs hanging on the walls which elaine is going to address a little bit later on in this presenta presentation but anyway Back to the definition of arts and health. The World Health Organization, I'll give you a little bit of background because I'm gonna go, give a quick overview about some of the highlights in this study, which is phenomenal, the, the, the amount of work that they put into this. But I do want to say to you that these definitions here, the use of the arts to promote, maintain, or improve health, corroborates with the two broad categories they found in the study. So basically what the WHO did in this report is that they reviewed over 900 publications between 2000 and 2019. And the title of the report is, what is the evidence of the role of the arts in improving health and well-being?" And what they found was that there's two broad themes, two broad themes that emerge within the study. And one of those themes is prevention and promotion. And the other one is management and treatment. So this is the effect that the arts have in these following things that I'm about to list. And again, this is right from the WHO report. I encourage everybody to check that out. But one of the things in prevention and promotion, which is really near and dear to my heart as a master certified health education specialist, I tend to, to gravitate toward that end of the health spectrum. But anyway, it, it affects social determinants of health, which the arts have been known to increase social cohesion to help with inequalities. They also support child development. There's been a lot of research in the area of mother-infant bonding, especially with singing. It helps with speech and language for, for child development. Also encourages health promotion behaviors, such as healthy living, engagement with healthcare, health communication, helps to reduce stigma. You see that a lot with drama, maybe through poetry, through music, and then and engages groups that have, have historically been marginalized and and anyway it also helps prevent ill ill health in, in in terms of the opposite of the positive end of that would be an enhanced well-being enhances mental health reduces cognitive decline frailty premature death also supports caregiving it helps people to understand issues that caregivers face with caretakers and also with clinical skills it helps doctors and patients improve their communication skills and relationships and, and the other thing is the management and treatment is the other sort of bucket. So we've got prevention and promotion and then management and treatment. And this, again, helps the arts will help to help manage mental illness, trauma and abuse, support care for acute conditions such as premature babies, inpatient care, surgery, intensive care. It also helps support for chronic conditions such as cancer, lung disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, 
And then the arts also can play a role in end of life support, such as palliative care or bereavement. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jill because she's going to talk about arts and health as a broad umbrella and then the different buckets, if you will, that fall under that. Take it away, Jill. Thank you, LaDonna. Um, so arts and health is a really broad interdisciplinary and um, truly innovative field, and it's also an academic discipline. Um, as a field, we see practitioners engaging the arts across a range of credentials. Um, one of those is the creative arts therapies, and this is a, a range of disciplines that has been around since the 1930s. And it's really important to distinguish the difference between creative arts therapists and professional artists who work in a healthcare context as artists in residence or arts practitioners. Creative arts therapists are clinical health professionals. They're mental health counselors or therapists who use the arts to address health goals. And that's distinct from an artist in residence or an arts and health practitioner who would work as a professional artist, bringing a high level of artistry and professionalism in the arts to bear in either clinical or community settings. Those artists are highly trained to be able to navigate those clinical and public health contexts, but they aren't clinical professionals and they're not setting or reaching toward distinct clinical goals. Um, so in within both the field and the discipline of arts and health as it's practiced and as, as it's taught, we think about three general buckets. So those are the creative arts therapies, arts in healthcare, which is artists practicing in healthcare environments, and arts in community health or arts in public health, which is professional artists practicing in collaboration with public health professionals or working with communities in the interest of, of health and in all the ways that LaDonna defined promotion, prevention, and communication. Now there's a reference, a link at the bottom of the paper to a paper that we published several years ago, which articulates these areas of practice and the discipline of arts and health and offers some common terminology um, for, for the field. So I invite you to check out that publication. It can be helpful in understanding these distinct areas of practice as well. And back to you, LaDonna. Thank you, Jill. Um, next, I'm going to talk about arts engagement, and this is a study that was done by Dr. Davies and her colleagues from the University of Western Australia, and this is just a really good illustration of the different categories, if you will, of the arts engagement. And I love this diagram because it really talks about the difference between active and receptive. And active, as it says, means making or creating, such as if I am in a I'm making, I'm painting a painting, or I'm playing an instrument. And receptive means I'm maybe viewing a painting in a gallery, or I am listening to a concert. So that sort of gives you an overview of, of the, the outer part of the diagram. And if we go in closer to the circle, we see this wonderful flower, and then each petal represents a different category that she found in her study from the survey that she distributed. And then I want to make, though, I do, I do want to pause for a second because I want to make a correction to a, a misinterpretation that happened in the WHO report that I was referring to a little bit a while ago. And the, the category, the pedal I really want to address is the one you see there that says community and cultural festivals, fairs and events. That was actually the category that emerged from Davies' study. And the WHO had listed culture as that category. And they put some things within culture, such as going to museums, galleries, art exhibitions, concerts, theater. And some of those overlap with the different other categories that Davies has. So I just want to make that correction that the community and cultural festivals, fairs, and events it should be the correct category. It shouldn't just be culture. It should be community and cultural festivals and fairs and events. So I'm going to take you around the flower here. And I want to start at the top, but I did want to make that correction. So it's uh, the performing arts. And I'll just give you a little bit about what, what she found there was that this is sort of activities in the genre of music, dance, theater, singing and film and concerts. And I'm going to move. I'm going to keep moving around the flower there. 
visual arts, design, and craft was the next category that emerged from Davies' study, and, and that's crafts, design, painting, photography, oh, near and dear to my heart as a photographer, sculpture, textiles, going to museums, galleries, art exhibitions. Then we've got the literature there, and that's really like writing, reading, attending literary festivals, and then the online, digital, and electronic arts, which includes animation, filmmaking, and computer graphics. And then we have backup, we, we circle back up to community and cultural festivals, fairs and events, and really what that entails. So, so if you think about it, there's many of you out there that have attended a festival, right? So you go into the festival, maybe there's a band playing on the stage, so then you've got the performing arts. And then maybe you have artists around that are selling their paintings or selling their crafts. So then, then you get into the visual arts. And then mm -hmm. you could see that a festival can involve many of the arts. And that's what Davies' study was referring to as about the, the cultural, the cultural perspectives and the festivals in the community. So I wanted to just take a moment to address that and, and just show you these wonderful genres of arts because many people maybe don't think that consider themselves an artist, but they really do participate. The arts are a lot more broad than sometimes people just when they think of art. So we have the active, as I said before, and the receptive, the viewing, and they both have benefits and impacts on health. So thank you so much. With that said, I'll turn it over to Jill. And one thing that I think is really important to bear in mind as we talk about arts interventions in public health is that the arts are multimodal interventions. They're interventions that do a whole lot of things at the same time as they engage people physically, cognitively, emotionally, and psychosocially. Um, so with that in mind, um, we've, we're building so much on the work that's been done in the field that's highlighted in the World Health Organization report. And in response to COVID-19, um, in particular today, I think the the connection between the arts and health is more visible than it's, than it's been in a really long time in our society. And we're seeing that the arts um, are, are doing a lot these days to help people around longevity, well-being, immune response. We see the outcomes that Dr. Fancourt has brought forward from her epidemiological studies um, that demonstrate these effects. And we're seeing right now, especially the arts being used to increase social cohesion, people connecting around arts activities online and in social distance um, safe formats in their communities as well. Um, a lot of public health programs have throughout history and throughout the world used the arts as ways to enhance interest in public health communication and in activities that are healthful. Um, they unite communities so naturally. People come together and do activities together and social co cohesion is enhanced in that way. And I'll share some examples of that with you all in a few minutes. Um, they also really improve communications within and across groups. So the arts allow people to talk about difficult topics, stigmatized topics in ways that more formal dialogues um, often can't facilitate as effectively. They also have a really unique way of being able to center unrep underrepresented, underrepresented voices and concerns. Um, and they change and shift collective narratives. So they illuminate culture, they illuminate stories, and they engage interest in those stories. Um, so the arts are uniquely powerful in all of those ways. And we can see the next slide. Thank you, Heather. Um, so over the past two years at the Center for Arts and Medicine, we've been working in partnership with Art Place America um, to, as, as our sh we use the shorthand, make arts and public health a thing in the United States. We recognize that for the past three decades, arts have been a very formal and widely accepted part of the health care system in the United States with programs at about half of hospitals now in the nation. But while the public health sector engages the arts in many ways, it really hasn't done so to this same extent formally. And so this translational initiative has undertaken a body of research, including evidence synthesis, and has created an array of resources designed to translate knowledge and evidence into practice and policy. And one of the primary resources that we've produced is this Creating Healthy Communities Through Cross-Sector Collaboration white paper. It's a report that focuses on five key public health issues, collective trauma, racism, mental health, social isolation, and chronic disease. 
and it offers examples and recommendations for how the arts can address these issues. I'm going to share one of those examples with you today. So on her first visit to Senegal, the poet and community organizer Hannah Drake immediately noticed that everywhere I looked, quote, on billboards and on art, I saw myself. There was never a question of whether I, as a black woman, exist in this space. When she returned home to the Smoketown neighborhood in Louisville, Kentucky, where she lives, which is the oldest African-American neighborhood in the city, she was struck by the stark absence of representation and the prevalence of predatory advertising in her community as well. When she mentioned this at community meetings, she found profound agreement among residents who were tired of people trying to sell them death in their community. In response, Drake and her colleagues from Ideas X Lab, along with the Smoketown Neighborhood Association and the Louisville Metro P Department of Public Health and Wellness, collaborated to create the One Poem at a Time initiative. This initiative replaced dozens of predatory billboard advertisements in Smoketown with really beautiful photographs of its residents, and each featured a different powerful six-word poem written by community members. One of the impacts of this work is that one poem at a time brought Smoketown residents together for ongoing collective action against racist practices. Soon after the initiative launched, the community not only prevented the opening of a new liquor store, but it also changed citywide policies regarding how residents are notified about new store openings. And Drake says, when I think of racism and redlining and how black communities are treated, that's what they put in our communities, liquor stores. We don't need more liquor stores. In addition to eliminating predatory billboards, one of the region's largest advertising companies agreed to feature art on its Smoketown billboards whenever they were not being used. Additionally, one, one, po one particular one poem at a time billboard which said, you are worthy, worthy of everything, led residents to request a Smoketown is worthy of everything mural, which went up in 2018. So one poem at a time exemplifies the ability of community-led arts-based initiatives to generate changes that produce health, both immediately and over the long term. And so today, as people reach to the arts to cope with social distancing and the stress of COVID-19, the relationship between the arts and health is more visible and more visceral than ever. In this pandemic, the arts have been used to have been central to connection, coping, and communication. And now they're being engaged in recovery and rebuilding efforts as well. So musicians around the world, as you may have seen, are singing and performing from their balconies. They're flocking to massive online music gatherings like those that DJ Denise and the CDC and Michelle Obama have collaborated on. They're experiencing joy and connection, and these artists are using their platforms to communicate critical and accurate health information from agencies like the CDC. And music has played a significant role in communicating critical health information. Over three and a half million people have watched Neil Diamond's handwashing song, for instance, and Charlie D'Amelio's TikTok dance about staying grounded and staying home has been viewed well over 10 billion times. 95,000 of those views were within the first 10 minutes and over 6 million views within 10 hours. Public health communication channels just don't work that fast or generate that kind of interest. And collaborative community songwriting, like the Lift Up Louisville projects, are providing communities with ways to experience connection in the midst of this isolation and better positioning these communities as well to collaborate in recovery and rebuilding efforts. So within this pandemic, the arts have been engaged for rapid and widespread communication by the World Health Organization, by the United Nations, the CDC, and the NIH. And these agencies who lead our national and global public health systems recognize that the arts can influence health behaviors for COVID-19 prevention and that they're essential to our well-being and resilience in challenging times like these. So LaDonna, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Jill. I'm going to let Heather fast forward just a little bit to the slides. I'll tell you when. I think it's just, yeah, right there, Heather. Thank you. 
So I am really excited to talk about this part because my students are near and dear to my heart. The reason that I am at the University of Minnesota Duluth and I am just delighted to really have been able to form some lasting partnerships with our space organization. And I'm about to introduce one in a minute here. We have Elaine on the call with us. But before I do that, I just want to talk about the pictures to the right and to the left of the center one that I have there, the right and left of Healing Photo Art. We were able to partner with an artist, a professional artist in Minnesota named Ann Lebovitz. And she came to the university and this was really a, a beautiful thing. Our students rallied around the cause and the cause was expressions of gratitude. And what we did was we were able to, she brought the supplies to embellish over 500 postcards. And you can see them there in that picture. And the students were literally writing postcards to total strangers. There was one that sat holed up in a corner with the phone book, the yellow pages. I mean, the old fashioned phone book. And yes, I still use them. But anyway, she was started from the Z and she just started writing postcards to total strangers just to tell them that they were appreciated and, and that they mattered. And, I, and my heart was so warmed by it. So we sent out over 500 of those postcards and the students sent them to loved ones and also to people that didn't even know and unhung, unsung heroes. And I was just really blown away. The students loved it. They had a great time. And then the photo to the, the other side of that, the dancer, that was one of my students. I had an assignment and that's actually Ann Lebovitz's work that you can see there hanging. She did this thing called 122 Conversations where she transcribed, tran she transcribed conversations into color, which was, I thought, pretty amazing. And she had these banners hanging in, in our in our uh, gallery on campus between Museum of Art. But anyway, I had an assignment for my students a little bit about take a picture of one of these paintings that remind you of, of where you want to be for your future. And then and there was another one, take a picture of where you are right now, and then a way to get from where you want to be, from where you are to where you want to be. Anyway, my student came up to me. She said, Dr. Tornabine, I love this assignment. She said, but and she was a dance minor. She's a public health major. She said, when I see these paintings, something wells up inside me and I want to dance. And I'm like, go ahead. Have it. Let's do this. So to make a long story short, I'll fast forward real quick. She ended up getting an internship with Ann Levovitz, and she actually was in the green room creating a dance. And you can see it, Heather, I'm gonna have the, the link to that in the resource file there. She created this dance and she she interviewed people from all over the world and she asked them their definition of love. It's going with the theme of gratitude and it's in many different languages. And she had original music set to it. She choreographed this dance to the definitions of love. And then she sets it on green screen so she could drop in the paintings to make it look like she was just at the gallery dancing. It's just phenomenal. She did a great job and I'm really, really proud of her. But anyway, I'll move on here. So those are the couple of the partnerships that we formed to get our students involved with the arts and health based activities. So I, the, the point that I wanna make here is that Sometimes we think as health education specialists, so if we're not artists, how can we involve the arts in, in our profession and what we do? And that's where, like Jill was talking about, cross-sector collaboration. And that's where you come together with an arts-based agency. Or if you happen to have a student that has a minor in dance or is an artist, then you can let them do some of the things that they want to do as part of an intervention to whatever the cause is. But also, I wanted to tell you that students that don't have any art experience at all can get plugged in to the Foundation for Photo Art and Hospitals. And that's where I'm going to introduce my colleague and friend, Elaine. And I just am so blown away by this woman's heart and her heart of generosity. And I just have to tell you this. This is her slide. This is her, this is her launching pad. I'm going to give her the show. But I just want to tell you all those little red dots you see there on the map, that's where she has her work. One person has her work on every continent and the world through her foundation for photo art and hospitals. Let's give it up for Elaine. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, LaDonna. You're too kind. <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what, what we do in my foundation. Uh, it's also called Healing Photo Art. Uh, we place uh, beautiful nature photos in hospitals all over the world, as you can see. And it's been going since 2002. Uh, and I, it, it became, came out of my experience with my mother in the hospital in St. Louis. She was in the hospitals for three months, 
And while she was there, I put my photos up in her room to bring color and uh, distract her from the hospital. And uh, she did pass away in the hospital. And after that, I decided to do this for other patients in other hospitals. And then I created a 501c3 nonprofit doing this. So we've been doing this for um, about 18 years now. And so far we've placed uh, over 8,000 photos, 8,000 8, photos in more than 400 healthcare facilities on all continents. So um, it's been quite an experience doing this through these last 18 years, it's been fantastic. So one uh, pro part of our foundation is including other photographers. In the beginning, it was just me, just my photos. And then after a few years, uh, I had other photographers contacting me saying, oh, this is a really good idea. Can I participate too? So we opened up the foundation to other photographers. And at this point uh, now, we have more than 350 contrib contributing photographers from all over the world who have donated their photos to our foundation. And um, just to let you know, our youngest contributing photographer is 11 years old. So it's just amazing. And it's a beautiful photo, I must say, just gorgeous. So uh, another part of our, um, our foundation is really fun for me. Um, it's the interns. Um, I've been working with LaDonna uh, for the past six years. And just from the University of Minnesota at Duluth, we've had uh, 25 interns. I've worked with them for the last six years, 25 interns. And it's it, through a program called Lynx. Um, not only the students from the University of Minnesota at Duluth, but I, I've had other nine other students from other university programs uh, in the United States and in from Florence, Italy, where, where I live. So of, of these students, four of these students have become contributing photographers. They're, they're um, amazing photographers. Excuse me, there's a fly flying around. <laughs> fly flying around me, okay. Four of these students have become contributing photographers, so their photos are going out in the world. Uh, and also, uh, the, the interns have included eight other university students uh, to become contributing photographers, so it just expands. So it's, it's wonderful to have young people um, participating in our, pro in our program. Now, most of the interns uh, coordinated photo projects in their local healthcare facilities. We have nine facilities in Minnesota that have received our photos, two in California, three in Florence, Italy, and four in Japan from the total number of, of interns that I've had in the last six years. Um, the five, five interns, um, I do want to talk about five interns from Duluth that, that uh, worked with me for the last year. They coordinated a project in their university's health services on campus. And those are those pictures that you see there on um, the top of the, the slide. Those are some of the students that uh, they, it, it was amazing because they would go, they would contact the uh, facility and they would offer our photos. And normally the, the, the uh, hospitals would say yes, or the health services would say yes. And then they would, um, <laughs> They would absolutely um, enjoy going there, taking photos before and then taking photos after, putting up the photos sometimes in these facilities. So it was, a, it was absolutely a hands-on project. So they got to really get in it. And I, they just had, they told me how, <laughs> excuse me, this, this fly is really amazing. Sorry, the, the, these kids were just, they loved it because they, it was a hand hands-on situation. <laughs> okay, they were actively engaged. Um, and some, some of the interns would interview patients or the hospital staff. They would interview contributing photographers and then they would cre create videos from these interviews. And these videos I placed on, on YouTube, on our website. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it was just a wonderful experience for them. Um, you can read that on the left-hand side of this slide is a review written by Melissa, who is our, uh, one of our um, interns in the springtime. And it's really beautiful what she wrote. Um, I don't know, do I have time to read that or? Go for it. Yeah, okay. 
Um, okay, it says, this semester, I've had the pleasure to work with the Foundation for Photo Art in Hospitals, and it has brought me so much joy. Three months ago, my grandmother passed away, and I spent a lot of time in the hospital and hospice care with her. Seeing art on the walls helped me to find comfort and brought peace in a not so happy time. The work that the foundation does allows for love, compassion, and healing to take place in patients and their loved ones. It has been an honor to work with Elaine, the founder, this semester, and bring others comfort in their time of need. There is so much love and soul in the work that Elaine does, and she has forever touched my heart. And that almost makes me cry <laughs> when I read that, when I read that, that was very sweet. Uh, and we're still in touch, contact, actually. But uh, the interns that I've had through LaDonna, LaDonna's program, is, they've been fabulous, just so much fun. So um, I just uh, would like to recommend if you are interested in requesting photos for your, your facility, anybody out there, or if you're a photographer that uh, would like to participate in our Contributing Photographers program, or if you wanted to coordinate a photo project for a hospital new year, just check out our website at healingphotoart.org and um, I'll get back to you and we'll, we'll make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanna take a minute. I know um, LaDonna, you're gonna talk about this as well, but uh, we were all kind of stifling a giggle there just a few minutes <laughs> ago. And I don't know what it is about sometimes just all of the amalgam of things coming together for a joint purpose, but I was just having a conversation with the Sophie internal staff this morning about how laughter can be used as a healing mechanism. And I was just connected to that thought in that moment that, you know, here we are having this conversation about the arts about the different connections of whether it's physical art or active or representative or how you perceive what you're looking at as art and all of these modalities coming together. So I think that what speaks to me most is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we've had a conversation today and we've learned a little bit about the amazing research that's out there that we wanna challenge people to go and continue to look at and continue to analyze and dig into for themselves. But I think it's also um, worthwhile to ask people to be participants. And so that's kind of what leads into this next call to action. Um, as you know, we'll be talking about this in just a second, we do have a community of practice that are maybe practitioners who are artists, but also practitioners who are health educators and are part of the SOFI membership community. And they want to learn more about how we can continue to come together and have these discussions, submit abstracts for um, annual conferences. Uh, as of right now, the abstract call is still open for SOFI 2021, if anyone's interested in doing that. And then also present your own art and so we would love to share that with others and ask you to consider sending in information and some of your own art through photograph um, to the following email address. And we're going to be posting that as part of a representation of August being National Wellness Month in the United States. And so if you're interested in being considered or having those things promoted online through Sophie, um, that's what this slide is for. You can take a screenshot of this. Um, but you can send an email to arts-health at sophie.org and we'll be collecting those submissions through August 15th. LaDonna, did you want to add anything else to that? Yes, I would love to. So thank you, Heather. And I also wanted to say that the use of, we're, we're using a technique or well, a method actually, methodology, the, the photo feedback methods to, to do what Heather just said, the call for photo submission. So in essence, what it is, is capture the concept of art as necessity to your health and explain why your picture captures that concept. And what the premise behind the, the photo feedback method, it was actually developed by myself and two of my colleagues at the University of Minnesota Duluth in public health. And it's defined as a qualitative image-based methodology that combines participant-initiated photography with written narrative in response to a research or evaluation inquiry. And so that we're asking you is, is the question that we're asking you is how do you see art as a necessity to your health? And I'll, Heather, you're gonna have that link to the, the critical features of the photo feedback method and the resource file because there, is, there are some things we wanna make you aware of. And one is ethics in photography and we have a link to that. And then we got some cool tips for photography, including phone photography. 
And we are wanting to have some fun with this. So that's why we brainstormed this idea to, to, to send us this, whatever it is that is photograph that illustrates this concept for, for you. And 50 words or less, please. And then uh, put your full name and where you're from with the, with the photo theme. So yeah, Heather, that's what I wanted to say. So thank you so much. Oh, community of practice. Yeah. All right. Great. Wonderful. Well, I tell you what, I, um, oh, this has been just amazing for me because I, I just want to take some time. I'm going to bring her into the picture here. Uh, this is Lisa Vogel saying, come on in, say hello. hello. So we're the co-chairs of Sophie's first arts and health community of practice. And when we first came to Sophie, we wore our, our little name. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to try anyway. And we have the community of practice badge now, but before that we had a little thing called visibility for arts and health in public health education. And we wore this little name badge to Sophie and over the years, it's sort of, Oh, I guess it, it generated some steam and we've got this community of practice going and really the Sophie has many community of practices with like 14 Heather. Yes. 14. But anyway, what I wanted to tell you about the community of practice is this, that, it's really, for me, it's about passion. It was about uniting people with a passion. If you have a passion for how the arts impact health, or you just love the arts and you find that, hey, it, it really does benefit your own health because we know the arts impact health at an individual level and all the way up to a community and a societal level. But really the, the essence of the community of practices is that we, we want to give you a place, it's for Sophie members, and we want to give you a place to exchange ideas, resources, research solutions around this topic of arts-based activities, as Jill mentioned, as Elaine mentioned, but for all of us to unite and come together and hopefully be able to meet in person at a Sophie conference. But we're excited about having this. It's an online platform. And ask and questions. Yeah, yeah. To get more information. Post questions. So we're, we're, we're delighted and, and blessed that this is part of Sophie now. And we invite you, if you're not a Sophie membership, Sophie has different levels of memberships and students. You're also invited to join us in this. So I'll turn it back over to Heather. I think we had a couple other pieces. Jill, did you want to talk a little bit about? I will, yeah, just briefly. Thank you, Heather and LaDonna. Um, I just want to wrap up my part by uh, briefly pointing you to some really useful and timely resources that we've created. Um, since March, we've developed an array of resources as a part of our COVID-19 arts response, uh, including local, state, and national governmental advisory briefs and evidence-based framework for using the arts and it's and an extensive resource repository. So. Um, I recommend you can access those resources. They're all free. The briefs in particular are really useful in calling for collaboration and noting why collaboration is important and citing examples um, of collaboration at, at the state, local, and national level. Uh, we've also partnered with Dr. Daisy Fancourt, who you've heard a lot about this afternoon, at University College London on a longitudinal study to understand the mental health impacts of sheltering in place and activities such as the arts that might buffer against those effects. Uh, the Center for Arts and Medicine and Americans for the Arts have partnered with Dr. Fancourt to extend the study to the UK. In the UK, they have over 90,000 people enrolled in the study. And every week, Daisy is reporting to the UK government on her findings about um, how people are faring from a mental health perspective within social isolation, and about how activities like the arts are buffering against those uh, negative impacts of COVID-19. So you can find those reports online. Um, her findings are suggesting that across age groups, people not only miss going to cultural events, but 81% are listening to music, 66% are reading books, stories, or poetry. And this is actually more than COVID-19. In fact, 21.4% of people are engaging more in the arts since sheltering in place measures have been in place. And this appears to be longitudinally associated with better mental health across the pandemic among those people. Um, so this is this, these findings are really important. In the United States, we've got about 7,000 people enrolled in the study so far. Um, so I wanna invite you to participate yourself and also to share the link um, to the survey with your networks. Once we get to 10,000 people here in the United States, 
we'll be able to share weekly reports as well. So those in real time findings will be available not only to researchers, uh, but to policymakers and people who are working on recovery and rebuilding efforts. That's perfect. And I think that one thing I just wanted to piggyback off of that, Jill, is that as all of this got started, as the pandemic began, I think one of the most interesting things that started to come to mind for me as a health education specialist and someone looking at this from the lens of public health was exactly that. What kind of research, what kind of things are we going to learn? And so many people right now are tossing around this idea of a new normal. So what's next? And I think that what you just mentioned, getting people involved, having these types of conversations and learning what we're all experiencing through this is going to be critical as we define what some of those new normal habits look like and how we continue to engage with one another in a new way. Um, so I think that what we're talking about today is not only timely and relevant, but um, I think it just adds to the con broader conversation of what's next. So one of those things that we also wanted to share with you is that you do still have a few days left. Um, the Health Promotion Practice is one of the three premier journals that Sophie offers peer-reviewed resources. And we actually have a call for submissions here that is still open and through August 1st. So if anyone is interested in also adding to that body of knowledge, as you can see here, it's related to, but not limited to different cross-sector collaborations. And particularly, I think a lot of those areas, those five particular areas that you mentioned from your white paper earlier on. So this is also something that you can learn about. One thing I also wanted to point out um, on behalf of Sophie, keep an eye on this post. We will be promoting this live through our YouTube channel, Sophie US. But also, if you learn about this through LinkedIn or any of our other social media platforms, know that we'll be posting these resources on the Sophie website, as well as underneath in the comment thread and in the description within the YouTube channel as well. So if you're looking for some of these additional resources after the fact, you're perhaps viewing this as a recording, um, know that you can find some of those resources there as well. LaDonna, did you want to add anything additionally to this comment here? I just wanted to give a shout out to Sophie to say, and to the, well, Jill, thank you for your role in this as well, because uh, this is really important. And I, I appreciate the, the theme for arts and public health for the Journal of Health Promotion Practice. So big shout out and thank you to those that made that happen. And I also just wanted to say, it's just an honor to have been able to share this presentation with all of you because I feel in so many respects, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in this field and also with the organization that Sophie, the caliber organization that Sophie Society for Public Health Education is. So I just wanna say thank you. Absolutely. So in conclusion, we just wanted to recap the conversation from today. We've, like I said, just barely scratched the surface on what some of the opportunities are that are available to us, some of the research that's out there in the field, um, and how we can continue to define and grow in that body of knowledge. So we've touched on that today. We've looked at some key examples as Jill presented to us um, through how these arts are being incorporated, how we're utilizing different things. Elaine also, not only um, are we doing that through billboards and uh, other sorts of health promotion outreach, but you're impacting people directly through photography and across the globe. I think that these examples are key ways in which we can continue to support the arts. And then um, lastly, let's join together. Let's do something about it. Decide whether you're going to, um, you know, make a change by joining the community of practice as a SOFI member. Perhaps you want to consider submitting something to Elaine's organization and the foundation to maybe get artwork into a hospital near you or a healthcare center. Um, so I just wanted to conclude all this to say thank you on behalf of the Society for Public Health Education. Um, thank you all for making the time um, for sharing your body of research and your work. Um, I know that this is something that we are doing consistently and constantly and particularly in the time we find ourselves in right now, it's so needed. Um, so I've listed some information here. Uh, feel free to screenshot this again if you're watching this as a recap or as a recording so that you can follow up and learn how to connect with any or all of our presenters today. And that's it. So oh, I wanna- oh, wait, 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 
Oh, Heather, sorry. But I noticed there's a mistake in my email. It should have an L in front of it. To be oh, L. okay. That's okay. Torna bean. Yeah, no, oh, no, L, L. Just put an L in front of the Torna B. L Torna B. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Got it. I'll edit that in the show notes and I'll make sure to add that to the bottom as well. Thank you so much. So we're going to end the broadcast for today. And um, I thank you for your time, for coming together. And let's see what we can do next in the way of arts and health. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.